All right, welcome. Uh, this class tonight is kind of a sequel to Visitor Sunday. Father has this introduction lesson more or less every time after Visitor Sunday. Can we actually do this in 60 minutes? No. <laughs> Orthodoxy is too vast. It's like an ocean. You dive into the ocean, uh, you never come to the end of it. So we'll simply be looking at a few key points and uh, central ideas, by no means uh, doing justice to all of it. So I like this one. Father Justin found this uh, undoubtedly. Uh, very appropriate for the start of Lent. Okay, what should uh, <laughs> the Pope give up for Lent? The filioque. All right, so that was, of course, one of the issues between Orthodoxy in the East and Roman Catholicism in the West that led to the schism uh, in the 11th century. There were others, and in fact, the role of the Pope himself was another key one. Um, but it's kind of worth bearing in mind, you know, this, this illustrates, I think, in a lighthearted way, something very important about Orthodoxy, that um, truth matters, and doctrinal truth is very important, and in fact, the word orthodoxy means right belief or correct belief. Orthos as in a straight line, orthogonal, for instance. Um, and uh, so things like the filioque are, you do have to take seriously because it's saying something important about the very nature of God. And uh, you know, there's a, fam a saying of Aristotle that a, a small mistake in the, in the beginning becomes a big mistake by the end. So uh, that's one reason why we, we do take doctrine seriously. Now I want to just counterbalance that. Um, this is the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity in Tbilisi, Georgia. And as you can see, there's a procession taking place. Uh, of course, the patron saint of the country of Georgia is St. George. And you probably recognize the cross of St. George there. Um, I love this picture partly because uh, it embodies two things that I think are, are so foundational to orthodoxy, beauty and community. Uh, of course, the, the church is beautiful and worth noting that that church, even though it, it kind of has an ancient uh, splendor and harmony to it, it's a modern church. That was completed in 2004. So the Orthodox Church still knows how to create beauty. And uh, of course, the church is nothing without the people. And so here you see the people gathered together in a liturgical procession. And you might almost define liturgy as communal beauty. It's the enactment of beauty in the worship of God together in community. Um, so that's something we'll be seeing over and over tonight. All right, so this is the uh, sort of the content that Father laid out under three headings. Orthodoxy is Christ, orthodoxy is paradoxy, and orthodoxy is union and communion. And we'll see what he means by those. Um, orthodoxy is Christ. Well, why do I have a picture here then of my beautiful wife and her parents? Because uh, the first point Father, I think, rightly makes is that we always receive Christ through others. And uh, there's no such thing as a sort of a disembodied, uh, disincarnate life as a Christian. So um, he, in his version of this presentation, kind of told the story of his own entrance into orthodoxy. So I'll tell you a little bit about mine. This is a picture from our wedding, 1983. Um, you all know Mary, my wife, is on the right, and her two parents, many of you knew because they were members of this parish until they passed away. Um, Dr. Allen was an English professor at Auburn, where I went to college. He, his field was Renaissance English literature. And when I met him, I was, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, a, a kind of lonely and confused Protestant, or even former Protestant. I don't think I was even going to church anymore. Um, because I couldn't find a church that seemed to me like it was very authentic, or was really uh, taking the whole of the gospel completely. Every church seemed to have its own particular niche, its own particular uh, sort of social set that it was catering to. Um, so Dr. Allen, uh, he taught courses as a, on Renaissance poetry. And uh, at one point, he did invite me to go to the church, the Orthodox Church in Montgomery. Um, it was a Greek Orthodox Church. He invited me to go for the procession of icons on the Sunday of Orthodoxy. And I did. 
Uh, I have to admit that I was a little bit, um, I wasn't sure what to make of it, but it, I recognized that it was beautiful. Um, and the beauty was uh, both attractive and sort of disconcerting. I was uh, a physics guy at this time. I was a physics major and I was very intent on um, finding truth. And I thought of truth as, you might say, the property that true propositions have, okay? I'd also taken logic classes where you do the truth tables, you label different propositions true and false. Um, and uh, beauty doesn't come in anywhere into that picture. And uh, I was a little bit afraid that I might be, so to speak, swept off my feet by the beauty of the Orthodox Church. Uh, so I was resistant to that. And I would say, looking back on it, that um, uh, it was by studying Renaissance poetry more than anything else, reading people like Shakespeare and Donne and Milton and many others, uh, that I kind of started to think about truth in a different way. Um, you know, if you just read the gospel, that it's clear that truth is not just a property of propositions. Uh, the Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He identifies himself with the truth. And that kind of poses for us the question, well then, what is truth? Of course, that's the, <laughs> the question Pilate, Pilate famously asked. That was sort of the question I was asking. Um, Pilate kind of asked it and shrugged it off. But um, I think, you know, one thing you can kind of pull out of poetry, as you can from maybe other ways too, truth is a way of being. Truth is a kind of openness to reality as it actually is, and, and therefore to seeking to live in light of that reality. And that's why poetry can have truth, even though it's not the sort of thing you would label as true if you're doing a truth table, it, because it's someone speaking out of that condition of truth in their inward being and articulating their experience. Um, and it's beautiful for that reason. That's why, for instance, the Psalms, which are poetry, are both true and beautiful, even when they're speaking about very difficult, painful experiences. You know, the psalmist of, often is speaking out of the depths. You know, he's, he's alone, he's abandoned, all his friends have betrayed him. Uh, and there's a kind of truth that he's giving utterance to. So you might say that's what I was kind of beginning to understand by studying poetry. Um, Dr. Allen was the, the gentlest soul you could ever want to know. He never sort of prodded me about orthodoxy. He always waited until I had a question. Or, uh, but one thing he did do, I was late with a paper. I was a whole year late with a term paper. Um, and he said, well, I'm not going to penalize you, but I want you to do some extra credit. So he assigned me to read this work called The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity by Richard Hooker, who was uh, a contemporary of Shakespeare. Big three volume work, <laughs> okay, probably the biggest extra credit assignment ever given to an undergraduate. Uh, took me, I don't know, more than a year to read it. Hooker was the great opponent of the Puritans in the Elizabethan period. And what he does in that work is to go through systematically uh, traditional Christian belief about things like apostolic succession, uh, the role of scripture and tradition, how they're complementary to one another, how scripture cannot stand alone outside of the context of tradition, uh, the role of the bishops and the priests, the hierarchy of the church, uh, the sacraments, uh, and on and on. And so he essentially dismantles Protestantism as I had known it. Not that I was a Puritan per se, but a lot of my ideas, I think, were those that are common in many Protestant churches that really kind of come out of that background. Hooker was an Orthodox, but he was, you might say, for me at least, the next closest thing. And by the time I had finished that book, I was pretty well ready. I mean, I'd, I'd come to realize that, yes, um, what matters in trying to find the church that's right, you might say, is that it be the church of the apostles, the church that the apostles founded and that still exists on this earth, all right? Uh, many Protestants have the idea you can sort of recreate apostolic Christianity just by reading the Bible and then kind of doing it on your own. Um, that's not the way it works and that's not the way Christ meant it to be. That's why he had the apostles then who in turn appointed their own successors who were the bishops and the bishops 
have continued that succession down to this current day. So that led me just to a, a different way of thinking in which I wanted to be part of that church, whatever it was, and I wanted to believe what that church teaches. And of course, um, historically, I think there's a very strong case that church is the Orthodox Church. So another point I want to make is that no matter where you start in Orthodoxy, no matter what path it is that leads you to become Orthodox, that's just the beginning. And you never stop learning, you never stop growing. Uh, one thing I certainly had no thought of when I converted was uh, it turns out the Orthodox Church is a wonderful place to raise children. Orthodoxy is very tactile and very colorful and uh, the hymns are beautiful and there's always movement taking place during the service. Uh, and even the fact that we stand in church rather than sitting in pews is helpful for little ones because they can wander around um, and you know they can see right? They can see everything in front of them. So uh, this is our daughter, Marion, when she was little with her two godparents at the church we attended in Huntsville at that time. It was a Greek church. Um, having godparents also makes a big difference. So uh, that's one way that orthodoxy sort of, you know, the more you grow, the more it grows with you. I think it's fair to say. The more you find that you're learning that you might not even have conceived of initially. Uh, these are two saints. The one on the left is St. Mark of Ephesus. Uh, the one on the right is St. Paisius Velichkovsky. Uh, they're both famous within Orthodoxy. St. Mark of Ephesus was an Orthodox representative at the Council of Florence in the 1430s. That was the, the council that tried to negotiate a reunion of the Orthodox and the Catholic churches. Uh, the Orthodox by that point were quite desperate because um, the Turks had conquered by far the greatest part of the former Byzantine Empire. It was essentially just Constantinople and a few of the surrounding area by that point. So they were desperate to achieve a reunion in order to get Western military aid, which could only come with the approval of the Pope. Um, St. Mark was the one who said no, all right? He left the council. He was the sole person the, um, among the Orthodox representatives who refused to sign the um, agreement of union. And he went back to Constantinople and he warned the people what you might say the powers that be, the emperor and the church hierarchy, were trying to do. Uh, that little scroll that he holds there, it says, to nevma, to agion, to ectu patros, ek portiu omenon. That's the part of the creed that says, the, the Holy Spirit uh, who proceeds from the Father, all right? And of course, it doesn't say, and from the Son. And that's why he's holding that scroll, because he, he stood fast for the Orthodox position on the Filioque and on many other issues. Um, uh, the one on the right, St. Paisius Velichkovsky, has a very different story. He was a monk, a Romanian monk of the 18th century. Um, 18th century is in many ways sort of the nadir of orthodox monasticism. That in Russia, that was the age of Catherine the Great, okay, who was scarcely orthodox at all except in name, and she used the church for her own political purposes. Um, in Greece, they were, of course, under the thumb of the Turks. Um, and so St. Paisius went to Manathos. He studied the ancient Greek manuscripts that were there of the writings of the Holy Fathers, particularly about the prayer of the heart, the Jesus prayer. And he translated them into Slavonic, which was the common language of the church in um, Eastern Europe and Russia. And then he published them. And that became what's known as the Slavonic Philokalia. All right. Uh, you can see the subtitle, The Man Behind the Philokalia. Uh, there, there are two versions of the Philokalia, okay, the Greek version, the Slavonic version. He was the one who edited and published the Slavonic version that led to the revival of monasticism throughout the whole Slavonic world, uh, Bulgaria, Serbia, Romania, Russia. And we, as the members of this church, were the inheritors of that Russian tradition. Um, you know, we, we, we look up to people like Dostoevsky, for instance, or Saint Seraphim of Sarov, you know, the great Russian ascetic of the 19th century. They couldn't have been without St. Paisius because the spirituality, the tradition, the monastic tradition that they were nurtured in 
uh, is based on that Slavonic filicalia. Um, well, why do I pick out these two? Um, so this is a little, another little episode of my life. Uh, when I came here to interview uh, at the University of Kentucky 25 years ago, um, I already knew, okay, it was no, it's kind of no secret, I think, to anyone, that uh, conservative Christians um, are generally not welcome in secular academia. And um, I did not have very high hopes of getting this job. Um, I knew that this would really only happen if uh, I had some help. So I prayed to these two saints because as I see it, they are the ones more than any others who preserved orthodoxy in the modern world, who spent their lives seeing to it that the truth of orthodox teaching, the, the, full, the fullness of the orthodox tradition would survive into a world that in many ways is very hostile. Um, so I asked them, you know, I simply said, if you want me to do this thing that's before me, um, please help me. Well, I mentioned that as just an example. When you become Orthodox, you're entering not just the community that's here and now, you know, in this local parish, or even in the whole Orthodox Church as it exists today. You're entering the community of the saints who have lived throughout human history for the past 2,000 years. So many different times and places, so many different stories. Um, they become your friends. They become the people that you look to, that you want to have their help, and you want to sort of uh, live your life in light of what they would have done, okay, and who they were. And it just becomes a whole different way of thinking about your life and who you are. Uh, you measure yourself, you sort of, you know, put yourself into their company in your own mind, not that you're worthy of their company, but those are the ones you're aspiring to be like. And it really makes a huge difference in, in your whole life going forward. And that's something you never stop growing into. Like I said, you know, orthodoxy is a kind of an ocean and you just swim within it. Um, and there really is no end. Orthodoxy is Christ. You know, I've, I've said a lot about sort of how do we receive Christ through the mediation of others? How is, uh, are the people we know and even the saints we pray to, they're part of that story. Um, all of that is sort of enacting, realizing the commandment that Christ gave to his apostles, uh, go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Um, that's the part people remember best. It's called the Great Commission. But then he continues, and lo, I am with you always unto the end of the age. Amen. And that's the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, well, what does it mean that he's with us until the end of the age? He's with us in the gospel. Uh, the gospel as it is lived and embodied in the life of the church. So I want to read a little bit of what uh, Father Justin wrote about this. What is this gospel that we talk about? The gospel is that mankind who was subject to bondage, sin, death, and the devil can be free. And that the key to this freedom lies not in a philosophy or a mere profession of faith, but in a living, breathing relationship with the one who has delivered us from sin, death, and the devil. Orthodox is, is concerned simply that there be no distortion of this person and the gospel he once and for all delivered to the apostles, who in turn pass it on to us in the church. Part of the DNA of Christianity and orthodoxy is that we do not believe we can arrive at the fullness of the truth unless God had himself intervened and broken into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. Because, of, because this is a revelation, it is a truth that must be celebrated, safeguarded, and proclaimed with fidelity to the original revelation. This is why St. Paul says, hold fast to the traditions I taught you. That's in 2 Thessalonians. This gospel is not something simply intuited or grasped. It is revealed, and it is a gift from God the Father, wrought by His Son, Jesus Christ, and manifested to us by the continuing presence and activity of the Holy Spirit. Orthodoxy is concerned with getting this right, faithfully preserving what was given in Jesus' teaching to the apostles, blessed on the day of Pentecost, and confirmed by the life of the Church since the first century again and again. 
All right, so if you think about church history, church history is very complicated, but in a sense, it's very simple. Church history is the story of the attempt to preserve orthodoxy, the attempt to preserve right belief and right worship um, as it had, was given to us by Christ and the apostles. Um, I think God did not intend that to be easy. If he had meant it to be easy, he could have given us in the Bible a simple recipe, right? Uh, a simple set of believe this and you'll be good. Believe this and you don't need to know anything else. Uh, but Christ taught in parables and St. Peter and St. Paul and, and the other authors in the New Testament, they say many things that are cryptic and that are uh, sort of touching on mysteries that are deep and that you just have to ponder. Um, and it, that's natural then. It's in inevitable that there will be disputes. There will be different interpretations. Uh, we know that St. Peter and St. Paul themselves disagreed about the reception of Gentile converts into the church. Uh, St. Paul tells us about that in Galatians chapter 2. So uh, it's nothing to be ashamed of that there have been controversies, but uh, controversy is only there for the purpose of, of attaining and retaining truth. All right, so I'm not going to read through all this, but in a nutshell, uh, you have the period of the seven ecumenical councils, you see beginning in 325 with the Council of Nicaea, ending in 787 with the seventh ecumenical council. That's sort of the classical era when the church was undivided between East and West. Um, and pretty much all Christians in the West today look back to that era as the definitive era uh, for Christian teaching. Uh, I say all, but that would exclude maybe some Protestants and so on, but at least Catholics, Orthodox, Anglicans, uh, I think it's fair to say even most Methodists and, and Presbyterians and so on. Uh, 1054, there's the Great Schism between the Orthodox Church in the East primarily the Greek-speaking half of what used to be the Roman Empire, and the, the Roman Catholic Church in the West, the Latin-speaking half. And of course, uh, in, the, in the West, the Roman Empire had fallen long before that, back in the fifth century. And so by this time, uh, that included uh, the Holy Roman Empire and also uh, the Kingdom of France and uh, England and so forth, all under the papacy. Well, uh, why was there the schism? I mentioned the Filioque a while ago. I think even the Filioque uh, could have been resolved. Um, it, it, it's a deep issue. There, there are important things at stake there. But um, I think uh, the real issue, in my opinion at least, was rather the role of the Pope. Because the Pope by this point had embraced the Filioque and had uh, decreed that it was to be part of the creed as it is recited in the Western Church. Um, the thing is that creed was written at one of the ecumenical councils, or really at two of them, the first and the second. Uh, the first began that process and then the second completed it. And uh, the council in issuing the creed had also specified nothing is to be added to this creed. Um, it can only be added to, if at all, by a further ecumenical council. And so the Pope was claiming to have that unilateral authority. And of course, if you know much of medieval history, he was claiming, in fact, universal jurisdiction over the entire church in a way that had never been recognized in the ancient church. The ancient church had always recognized uh, different patriarchs, um, each as having a sort of sphere of authority or territory. Uh, Rome was first, to be sure, but also the patriarch of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, those five were, were considered what was called the Pentarchy. Um, and of course, they had, there were many other bishops as well, and all bishops uh, collectively were to meet in, in councils, and it was councils that were the final authority in the church, not any one person. So uh, because of that, we have the schism, and of course, in the West, uh, I think one thing, I think it's fair to say, uh, I'm not trying to bash anyone, but uh, if you know, again, much medieval history, once the Pope was free to govern the Western Church according to his own dictates without being answerable to any other bishops, uh, much less a council, 
then uh, there was a lot of rapid change that took place, and much of it, uh, I think, very questionable, and that's what led to the Reformation, all right? Such things as indulgences um, that, of course, Luther uh, reacted against. And once you have the Reformation, um, once that process begins, it just doesn't stop, because then every, every preacher, every theologian has his own idea of what the church should be, and they, they just keep splitting off one from another. And uh, I don't know if you can read the fine print up there, but it says that today there are over 25,000 different Protestant denominations. Um, orthodoxy simply is what it's always been. That's not to say there's never been, there's no change. There's, there's sort of organic development. But we never underwent uh, uh, a reformation, um, nor any great uh, uh, schism within orthodoxy. It's simply the loss of our, you might say, our Western brethren. Orthodoxy is paradoxy. Father Thomas Hopko, uh, he passed away, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, but he was the dean of St. Vladimir's Seminary and a, a wonderful preacher. Uh, here's what he says. The scripture is very clear. If you want to find yourself, lose yourself. If you want to fulfill yourself, empty yourself. You want to be great, be the least. You want to be first, be the last. You want to be rich, become poor. You want to be wise, become a fool. If you want to rule, become a servant. Really, orthodoxy is paradoxy. That's just what it is. Um, that, I think, is, is very true. It's, in fact, a profound truth. Going back in some ways to what I was just saying about the nature of Scripture itself. Um, scripture is paradoxical. Scripture presents us with the mystery of God becoming man and the mystery of God as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, sort of embedded within those, there are many, many other mysteries. There's the mystery of uh, God speaking to, Mount, to Moses on Mount Sinai and um, the mystery of the tongues of flame that descended on the apostles of Pentecost. Um, this is St. Ephraim the Syrian. He's a great uh, poet of... Um, I believe, um, fourth century, wrote in Syriac, but much of it translated into Greek. Uh, Father included him because um, here's one of his hymns from the period of the Nativity of Christ. Thy mother is a cause for wonder. He's addressing Christ, of course. The Lord entered her and became a servant. He who is the word entered and became silent within her. Thunder entered her and made no sound. There entered the shepherd of all, and in her he became the lamb, bleeding as he came forth. Thy mother's womb has reversed the roles. The establisher of all entered in his richness and came forth poor. The exalted one entered her, but came forth meek. The splendorous one entered her, but came forth having put on a lowly hue. The mighty one entered and put on insecurity from her womb. The provisioner of all entered and experienced hunger. He who gives drink to all entered and experienced thirst. Naked and stripped, there came forth from her he who clothes all. Um, expressing, I think, beautifully the paradox of the incarnation, the paradox of Christ. And um, in light of that, I think we can understand other paradoxes you find in church history, in Christianity as it exists within the world. Holiness versus worldliness. Um, we all seek holiness, rightly so. Um, holiness means being close to God. Um, I, I'm afraid to admit it. Uh, the church couldn't exist if we didn't have worldly people within the church. <laughs> worldly people often make more money than holy people do. <laughs> uh, if you're going to have a church, you have to have a building, right? You have to pay a priest's salary. I mean, I'm not saying, therefore, we should seek to be worldly, but uh, uh, we value what everyone can contribute in their own proper way. Um, and we don't diminish anyone. The church is a body of Christ, and the body has to have different members. Uh, here's another one, church versus empire. Again, if you know much church history, the church and the empire, even in the Golden Age, even in the Byzantine era, were constantly at odds with one another. Um, there were emperors who were heretics who tried to impose their heresies on the church. 
beginning with Constantius, the son of Constantine, who was a saint. Uh, Constantius was an Arian, and that's why the Arian controversy lasted for most of the fourth century. Um, and he, po he appointed bishops. Um, our own namesake, St. Athanasius, the patriarch of Alexandria, uh, went into exile five times because he had to flee because the emperor's goons were looking for him <laughs> to arrest him and throw him into prison because he was resisting imperial policy. And there's a famous saying, uh, Athanasius contra mundum, um, uh, Athanasius against the world because he was the last orthodox bishop left in the whole Eastern church. Uh, and the only reason he was left was because the emperor hadn't been able to capture him. Um, that's pretty much the story of church history. Uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, he's another one who comes to mind, who was persecuted. Uh, his right hand, the emperor had his right hand cut off and his tongue cut out so he could no longer write or speak and then sent into exile where he had to walk hundreds of miles to get to this little town under a guard um, and he was already an old man and uh, he died of that. That's why he's called a confessor. A, to be a confessor means that you weren't killed per se, but you died because of what you suffered for the faith. Well, that's the story of church versus empire. Yet the church couldn't have existed without the empire. All right. Um, in fact, um, the fathers viewed it as providential that Rome conquered the world and in doing so established the system of Roman roads and Roman currency and the universality of the of Greek and Latin as sort of the lingua franca. Of, of the whole world, the known world at that time. And that's what enabled Christianity to grow and to spread as rapidly as it did. Uh, poverty versus riches uh, sort of goes along with holiness versus worldliness. Sobriety versus joy. Those two, those again are opposites and they're both present in the church. Uh, we're about to enter Lent. Lent is a period of sobriety. Lent is the period when we try deliberately to think about our sins to recognize them and to, to bring them for God in repentance. But Lent culminates, uh, Lent and Holy Week culminate in Pascha, which of course is the period of greatest joy, uh, the Feast of Feasts. And one thing about Orthodoxy, as most of you know, uh, if you fast through Lent and Holy Week, uh, that's a long fast. And when it comes to Pascha and you're able to eat again, uh, it's impossible not to feel joy, <laughs> okay? Uh, you couldn't do it if you tried. Uh, uh, and, and the whole church is experiencing that joy together because the whole church has been through Lent together. So uh, sobriety and joy are both are essential to the Christian life. Power versus powerlessness. Again, uh, the church needs worldly power in some ways, um, but um, uh, the church itself, you might say, is sort of powerlessness embodied because the church is the body of Christ. And Christ came to offer himself as a sacrifice for many. So we always have martyrs. There's never been a period of Christian history where there haven't been martyrs. But the greatest age of the martyrs is now. There are more people being martyred for Christian faith today than at any time in world history. Um, and many of them Orthodox. Uh, and finally, uh, asceticism versus freedom. All right. Uh, asceticism is integral to orthodoxy. I mean, we have monks and nuns, that's important. But uh, even if you're a layman in the world, you still are called to an ascetic life. You still have to fast during the periods of fasting. You go to church and you stand. Uh, and during Lent, you go, you stand for a long time, hours on end. Um, and you make, you make a pilgrimage to the monastery. Um, and in other ways too, you learn to to say no to your own desires in order to put God first. That's the ascetic life. Uh, the word asceticism is just from ascesis, which means practice. It's like practice as in training, athletic training. It's what athletes did in the ancient world. So it's kind of like athletic training. But um, at the same time, you know, St. Paul teaches we're not under the law. And we have the freedom, uh, the glorious freedom that's been made possible by Christ. And so none of these ascetic practices or anything that sort of uh, create um, uh, a standard of merit where you have to live up to this certain level or else you don't get into heaven. Uh, it's not like that. You know, when you go to, orth to uh, the Pascha service, 
The priest always reads the uh, Paschal homily of St. John Chrysostom, in which he begins by saying, uh, those of you who waited to the 11th hour, right, who didn't keep the fast at all, enter into the joy of the feast, all right? Everyone is welcome. Everyone is embraced by Christ. So um, the asceticism that we do is never a matter of, I do this and I'll be holy. I do this and I'll be better than that other guy. Um, it's simply the training we all have to go through to the extent that we can. But uh, recognizing at the same time, some people have a holiness all their own, you know, and they, they do it in their own way. And God bless them. Um, so, the cross. Um, this is the ultimate paradox. God dying in the flesh. Um, the thing to notice there, this is not what you would have seen if you had been present at the crucifixion. You would have seen a very bloody um, man in, in, in agony, um, naked. Um, the sign above him saying, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, deliberately mocking him because he had supposedly claimed to be the King of the Jews. That's what he was put on trial for. Um, and uh, we don't show him that way. We show him as the King of glory with his arms stretched out, welcoming the world, embracing the world, and his face serene and at peace because he's, he's done the task that his father gave him to do. And of course, at the left is his mother, the Theotokos, and uh, excuse me, at his right, and his left, uh, St. John, the apostle. Uh, the two that we know were at the foot of the cross, both pointing to him. So um, as long as we worship Christ, you might say we live in paradox and uh, glory to God. Orthodoxy is union and communion. Um, this gets us into sort of the nitty gritty of being orthodox. Um, here we have St. Athanasius the Great on the left and uh, on the right a little scene from Saint, the other St. Athanasius, our St. Athanasius. Uh, Father giving communion to one of the children. All right, the Holy Trinity. Um, sure, most of you recognize this is uh, the, the Trinity of, of Rublev, the great Russian iconographer. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Moscow, do. Just for this, I mean, just so you can see Rublev's Trinity. It's in what's called the Tretyakov Gallery, where the Russians are wonderful because they have one gallery for their own art, and then the other gallery is for all the foreign art, okay? Um, and the one you want to go, go to is the one that's for their own art by Russian artists. That's the Tretyakov. It's right across the street from um, uh, uh, Christ the Savior Cathedral, the great huge cathedral in the center of Moscow. And when you, you see this icon, uh, uh, you just want to stand there forever because uh, it's nothing like the picture. The picture can't even begin to do it justice. Um, it's truly an icon of communion. It's this, these are the three angelic visitors to Abraham in Genesis 18. Uh, the church fathers interpreted those as an icon of the Trinity, an icon in the sense, an, an image of the Trinity. Um, and what you see in the way that they're facing one another and the way that the colors of their clothes are sort of, you, you see that blue that's repeated in a, almost like a circular pattern, how um, each one is, is uh, adoring and uh, glorifying the others. Um, that's what the fathers refer to as the perichoresis, the sort of the mutual adoration and glorification within the Trinity. And that's important because it, it's the foundation of the Christian faith. Communion, interpersonal communion, is at the heart of Christianity. And that's what we see portrayed in this icon. So, two central sacraments, baptism um, being one, I guess both, oh, and chrismation, yeah. Um, I'm sure you all recognize those. And, yeah, the Eucharist. Um, there they're praying um, the prayers of consecration. Um, but those are not the only ones. 
they're the ones that we might perhaps think of first. I'm sure you all know uh, in the Catholic Church there are seven sacraments. Orthodoxy doesn't necessarily have just seven. Um, you have to kind of ask, um, what is a sacrament? So let me, let me read a little bit again from Father Justin who kind of puts this into context. He says, um, salvation is not merely transactional. Uh, to accept or assent to the sacrifice is not enough. And I think that's a point worth bearing in mind, you know, so much of sort of the evangelical Christianity that, that most of us uh, are familiar with is all about that moment of decision, accepting Christ as your personal Savior. Um, whatever that is, that acceptance, that assent is only the beginning of a path. We must meet Christ and keep meeting Christ in the sacrifice that he made. This explains the martyrs, the call to take up our cross and follow him, the whole sacramental devotional aspect of orthodoxy, the whole ascetical, mystical nature of ancient Christianity. And Father inserts in here, Joel Osteen and Prosperity Gospel, anathema, all right? <laughs> uh, Christianity is not about prosperity in this world. We meet Father, the Father through the Son who now sends the Holy Spirit. We participate in the life of the Holy Trinity, as in the icon of the Trinity. So union and communion with God is vital. Almost equally vital for the Orthodox, and this really sets us apart from American Christianity, is our, the, our focus on the communion with our brothers and sisters. Uh, the Church Fathers had a saying, one Christian is no Christian. And there's a Russian proverb, the only way to go to hell is to go alone. Just as Christ shows solidarity with us, we show solidarity with each other in the church. Truth is never private. There's no private interpretation of scripture. It is the purview of the church. Even the scriptures were canonized by the church and for the church and must be interpreted by the church. And that's why sola scriptura is not part of orthodoxy. So if we believe that union and communion are central to Orthodox Christianity, it's pretty clear that a sacramental participatory worldview lies at the heart of the Orthodox Church. What then is a sacrament? And here he quotes Metropolitan Hilarion of the Russian Church. He says, the Orthodox Church regards the sacraments as sacred actions through which an encounter takes place between us and God. In them, our union with God is realized as far as this is possible in this earthly life. The sacraments bring us into communion with the divine nature, animating and deifying us, restoring us to eternal life. In the sacraments, we experience a foretaste of the kingdom of God. Each sacrament involves both physical and spiritual dimensions, united in one. In other words, the sacrament itself is already a kind of union and communion taking place between the physical and the spiritual. That union itself is a token of the ultimate act of the union of the physical and the spiritual, namely the incarnation itself. Every sacrament is in some way uh, making present to us the reality of the incarnation. Uh, it's normally presided over by a priest uh, because the point of sacramental life is to restore the created order to its proper place, to its right ordering before God. And that is the quintessential task of the priest, to offer up this created world, this material world, as an offering to God. Restoring all of creation back to itself is what the sacraments, the holy mysteries, are doing. Um, uh, what then are the preeminent sacraments? Um, baptism and the Eucharist. But uh, let's also notice there are the others, and then I'll, I'll just go through these. On the right, of course, uh, confession. And uh, if you're not Orthodox or you're not familiar with it, when you go to confession, um, you face the icon of Christ and the gospel book before you. The priest is on your side listening, but you face Christ, and Christ is the one you're speaking to. Um, and then um, uh, when you're finished, you kneel and the priest uh, reads the prayer of absolution. Um, that's essential. I mean, that's, you can't be orthodox without confession. And uh, as I mentioned with Lent coming up, that'll be on all of our minds soon. But, um, you know, I can say from my experience, 
um, I learn something every time I go to confession. I learn more about myself. I learn because I've had to probe myself to try to recognize what I need to bring before God. Um, blessing of the waters. The great blessing of the waters at, that takes place every year at the Feast of Theophany, which is the Feast of the Baptism of Christ on January 6th. Um, that's one of the holy mysteries. It, it wouldn't be considered one of the seven sacraments, but um, in the sense that a sacrament we, under, as, as Orthodoxy understands it, that's a sacrament. And of course, the priest then brings that into your home. Um, again, if you're not familiar with it, um, the priest visits every home in the parish and blesses it with that holy water. Okay, so that's another way in which you might say the spiritual enters into and penetrates and transforms the physical, including our own homes. Um, then the sacrament of holy matrimony. Again, I think that one is clear. Um, and that of ordination. This is from Father Justin and Matushka Tamra and JP. All right. And the bishop, if you don't recognize him, that was Archbishop Dimitri, who was for many years the bishop of the Diocese of the South. Um, and so uh, to be ordained as a, as a, as a priest, uh, or also to take monastic orders. Those two are our sacraments in Orthodoxy. And then last of all, uh, burial and, and the sacrament of Orthodox burial. I mean, I recognize our parishioners are there um, casting in the first spadefuls of dirt. That too may be the culminating sacrament. All right, so orthodoxy is Christ, orthodoxy is paradoxy, orthodoxy is union and communion together. Uh, last thing that Father lists here, just places to go for further resources. Ancient Faith Radio. Um, uh, has a huge library of podcasts um, on all kinds of topics, all many different Orthodox speakers, including Father Hopko, the one that I uh, was reading from earlier. And also the OCA website is a great resource. Among other things, you can find there the lives of the saints for each day, uh, as well as the appropriate scripture reading that's, that's part of the liturgical calendar. Questions, comments, worries, uh, Audrey? Um, you mentioned that, you know, the, the disputes and controversies earlier and that um, there are some things maybe that are cryptic in the scriptures. Um, that's something I've noticed in myself and I was just wondering, do you think that, are there some scriptures do you think that we're not even intended to understand or do you think we are intended to understand them all and just have to work towards that? Um, or what's your view on that? I guess it depends on what you mean by understand. <laughs> I think everything there um, can be understood to a certain level. I mean, we understand the words, right? We know this is a meaningful sentence. I know what it's... It's just that... Um, what's the meaning, right? Right, the meaning. Yeah. What's, what's the... Uh, I mean, I'm, if I had a few minutes, I could think of examples, and I'm sure you could too, of so many things in Scripture... Um, you know, like St. Paul says, um, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I understand what that means, I think. Um, but then again, I don't, because I haven't really done it. <laughs> I haven't lived through it, at least not fully and completely the way he's describing or, or, or commanding. Um, so I just, I have a superficial understanding of that, what it really is to be uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right? That's something like so much in Scripture, you can really only understand by experience. All right? And I think that's the key that Scripture is given to us to be our companion and guide throughout a whole lifetime. Okay? It's not like a textbook that you read once and then you've got it and you don't need the book anymore. Uh, it's the book that you sort of live in, you sort of swim in it, you know, your whole life. Uh, and you're constantly finding more there because you're changing and your experience is growing. So, and I don't think that process ends, I mean, in this life, and I'm not even sure it would end in the afterlife because, you know, the fathers teach that there's perpetual progress into God, into the mystery of God, even in the afterlife. So, um, that's why I think scripture is something we always sort of understand, but we're always also 
struggling to understand. Seeing through a glass darkly, like this Corinthian says, kind of, yeah. like, kind of like that. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and it's a spiritual discipline. You know, I was talking about asceticism, spiritual training in a sense. Um, studying scripture is an ascetic act. Okay? Um, that's what the monks do when they're not praying. <laughs> they're studying scripture. You know, memorizing scripture. Of course, you know, there's an old saying that um, um, you're not a monk if you don't have the whole Psalter memorized. It's just because they recited the Psalter so often. You know, they prayed from the Psalms every day repeatedly. Um, and so it was so much a part of their whole being. Um, and that's what scripture should be for us. You know, it's something that uh, we meditate on and take, take joy in reading and pondering. Um, and by doing that, we're, you know, we're doing, we're doing what St. Paul said, being transformed. Other questions or thoughts? Yeah? Um, so when Pontius Pilate, he's, he's asking Christ, Christ, I think, is on the floor, I think, and he's asking what, it, he's asked what is truth, and he doesn't, act, and Christ doesn't, doesn't respond. Um, but truth is, like you were mentioning before, truth is correlated with Christ himself mm -hmm. as a person, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like this whole aesthetic, the aesthetic struggle, we're commanded to fast, prayer, and give alms. We're trying to do all of this because ultimately we're just trying to get close to a person, namely the person of God, mm -hmm. right? Is that, and so like... Yeah, we're, well, so truth... Um, you know, in, in Psalm 51, it says, um, refers to having truth in your in, in, inmost parts. Um, what does that mean? You know, I think it's truth in, in one, at least one way of thinking about it is that it's openness to reality as it actually is. Not as you would like it to be, not as uh, would be convenient to you. Um, in other words, that... Uh, true statements and, and known facts and so forth are for you sort of stepping stones to reality and not things that you're going to use to, you know, make yourself look better, make yourself get ahead in life. I mean, you can, you can do this no matter what field you're in, no matter what sort of truth you're dealing with. You can approach it as something that I know and other people don't, and that gives me an advantage. Or you can approach it as, this is the pathway to what I really want, which is reality, <laughs> okay? And when you want, what I, what I mean by that is you don't want just to sort of know something external to yourself. You want to conform yourself to it. You want to live within it. Um, you want that reality that's beyond you to be yours in the deepest sense. Um, and that reality that you're seeking, okay, you could also call it being, okay, that would be sort of the, a more characteristic philosophical way to describe what you're seeking, being itself, which is one of the traditional names of God, um, as is truth. Truth is also one of the traditional names of God, as is beauty, by the way, uh, and life and wisdom and power and glory. Those are all names of God. Uh, they're, they're sort of ways that we have of understanding what God is within the concepts that are available to us. So one of the ways in which God, you might say, is sort of manifest and available to us is as being, as reality. And when you're seeking truth, that's what you're seeking. All right? I mean, if you're seeking it from the inmost parts. Um, and that's why it's, it's Christ names himself as the truth. Yeah. He's also the word, right? Um, the word that the logos, who is the truth of, of what is, uh, who, who calls the whole world into being. Um, Pilate, he's a kind of a model of the other way of thinking about truth, which is, bah, <laughs> humbug, you know. Uh, he doesn't care. Uh, there's a little poem by, I think, Ben Johnson, one of those Renaissance poets I was mentioning. Um, Jesting Pilate asked, what is truth? And would not stay for an answer. <laughs> okay? He didn't really, he wasn't asking because he wanted to know. <laughs> he was asking because he thought it, there's no answer. Okay? Um, 
And that's why Christ didn't answer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if, you know, and, and we see this throughout the Gospels, you know, that the people who know the law, the Pharisees, some of them respond to him as, you know, like Nicodemus did, um, recognizing that he is the truth, even though he is not the one that they expected. He's not what they expected the Messiah to be. But the others think, no, the truth has to fit into the categories I've got. Okay. Um, the law has already told me what the truth is. That's what enables me to be a good Jew, unlike the, all these other people. Um, and if this guy is coming along, he doesn't fit those categories, then he ain't it. And otherwise, they're not open. They're not receptive to truth revealing itself um, in a way that transcends anything they understand. So kind of a warning, you know, to all of us. And that's worth remembering about orthodoxy that we believe in right teaching, right doctrine, right? But we don't therefore believe that we know all the answers. <laughs> Very far from that. Um, it's a mystery. So. Um, 